got Miss Tinker here with me today, and video this week's kind of all about them. Uh, we did our usual flintlock squirrel hunt back a few weeks ago. The guys come in from all over, and you know, it's all about the dogs for the most part. So I took a few historical uh, readings and put them along with this video this time. And don't take this as any sort of historically accurate and or uh, history lesson because it's not. It's purely for entertainment. Did right, big girl. So come along with us. Hey, hit that like and subscribe button as always. And we hope you guys enjoy the video. Tell them, Tinker. Enjoy the video. Yeah, she's not amused at all. Hunting had progressed, however, since the days when Captain Miles Stangis floundered through the woods with his bugle mouth weapon. Not the least improvement was in the use of dogs. One wonders how the pilgrims managed without them. Lawson took a spaniel bitch into the woods with him, and southern farmers commonly owned coon and foxhounds. Some had dogs trained to follow bear by scent, and then the bark and snap at them till he trees. Then there were bird dogs and many other varieties for all Europe had known and loved the dog as had the Indian, but the American dog that would come from the first settlers to the Cumberland and could trail an Indian, spring on the back of an elk, and begin chewing on its neck in search of the spinal cord, catch a chicken for the pot, or kill the rattlesnake that threatened the baby, and developed rather slowly. Taken from Sea Time on the Cumberland. I have often seen them get up early in the morning at this season, walk hastily out and look anxiously to the woods and snuff the autumnal winds with the highest rapture, then return to the house and cast a quick and attentive look at the rifle, which was always suspended to a joist by a couple of buck's horns or little forks. His hunting dog, understanding the intention of his master to wag his tail and by every blandishment in his power express his readiness to accompany him to the woods. Joseph Doddridge Sunday, May 21st, 1775, half past 9 p.m., arrived at the north of Kentucky River. Expected a larger river, but it is not larger than the Kanawha, or but little difference. Set into raining, rolled up about one mile in camp, spent the rest of the day in my tent. It continued raining, stayed there all night, had no fire on account of the Indians, but the dogs barked so incessantly, being abundance of wolves in all these parts, that had any Indians been near, they may have found us by the dogs. James Nurse Journal, 1775. Another? Yeah. You get one totally wrong. All right. Pretty long. Yeah. Down there. And, uh. This was an important part of the employment of the early settlers of this country. For some years, the woods supplied them with a greater amount of their substance, and with regard to some families at certain times, the whole of it. For it was no uncommon thing for families to live several months without a mouthful of bread. Again, Doddridge.
seen all these dishes. Eighteen hundred? Yeah. Yeah. That's actually it's a new Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Take it down there and talk to the